in our gathering song, Revive Us Again.
we will have a wonderful service at 10 a.m. Uh, there is a potluck to follow and there are sign-up sheets on the table out there. I encourage you to sign up for what you're going to bring so we can make a good plan. Uh, two more announcements, I'm getting close. Um, many of you have reported by the way, difficulties in receiving Sarah's emails over the past few weeks since she got started. We have discovered that without fail, these emails are going to people's spam folders. So if you have not heard anything from the church in the past couple of weeks, check your spam folder. Uh, we always use the same email. It's our first initial last name. So hers is S Evans at TuscolaUMC.org. So please look for that and mark it not spam so you can receive messages from the church. My final announcement, and I asked Ingrid if I could use her as an example. Um, many of us uh, struggle with focus. And one of the things that they are now uh, really teaching is people who struggle to focus often do better if they're using their hands while they're listening. So for instance, Ingrid is sitting over here crocheting, right? Or knitting, knitting. I can see, I can see the second needle. She knits and she knits every service and I watch her knit, but I know she knows the sermon because she's always texting me about the sermon afterward. For her, it's a focusing device. And so we have decided for those of you who might need some help, we have put out some adult coloring sheets that have Bible verses on them and are really nice. And they are on, I believe, on the back table. Even if you don't want to do it in church, feel free to pick one up. There's a regular one and there's a journaling one and take them home and work on them. It's a great way to memorize some Bible verses while doing something that feels very spiritual. Uh, it's a very strong spiritual practice and it allows your mind to more tightly focus on what's going on around you. I think that's every announcement I have. Do we have any more announcements? Then I invite you to take a deep breath to feel the presence of the Holy Spirit that we welcomed last week among us and to feel God here among us as we listen to the prelude.
stand as you are able. Our sovereign Lord is majestic, filling our hearts with song. Our sovereign Lord is wise, ennobling our minds with truth. Our sovereign Lord is gracious, empowering our souls with strength. Our sovereign Lord is loving, blessing us with peace. Come be with us, God the Creator, Christ the Redeemer, Spirit the Sustainer. Come be with us, God, Spirit of Wisdom. Amen. Are any of our kids able to read yet? What is this pen for? 
The cows. The cows. What's the next pin for? Let's look and see. Pigs. What's the next pin for? Chickens. And what's this pin for? Horses. I, I, may, have, I may have to call PETA. Y'all got too many horses for the square footage here. So I love it. All right, come on back up and let's come talk about all this. Because there's animals and plants everywhere. What do we think? Come on up. Why don't you guys come sit right here for me and I'm going to ask you a few questions. So, go ahead and sit right here on the steps. So we have animals and plants, pretend animals, pretend animals, and pretend plants in the church. Why do we think, what do animals tell us about God? Can you think of what an animal would tell you about God? Uh, what are animals? Take a nap. To take a nap? What else do you think? What could an animal tell us about God? Ramsey? Farms. Farming? Oh, you're on the right thing. Farms and we, when we have farms, we grow things and things come out of the earth. What comes out of the earth at a farm? Uh, Chickens come out of the earth at a farm sometimes. Sometimes they go into the earth. David? Pigs. Pigs. Uh, we have all kinds of animals. You know what animals tell me? Animals tell me that God loves us. Because God gave us the ability to grow corn to eat. Does anybody like yummy corn? And to grow pigs to eat. Does anybody here like bacon? Unfortunately. God gave us so many things to take care of us. And David, do you know why God gave us things to take care of us? Because God, because God loves you. So when we look around and we see all the things that grow and all the animals that God created, God only gave us that for one reason. And it's because God loves Ramsey. God loves David. God loves Ezra, God loves Julia, and God loves Kate. Let's take a prayer. Let's say a prayer. Ready? Dear God, thank you for loving us. Amen. All right, guys, you can head to the back and have a wonderful time today. Amen. Uh-oh. Wipe out, everybody okay? Okay. You know, it's funny when one of them wipes out, we don't pay attention. One of you wipes out, we're all over it, just so you know. <laughs> As we turn to our time of offertory, we are reminded of God's call on us to be generous and loving to those around us. I ask you to hear God's call on your life as we listen to the offertory music.
and bless these gifts we give in the name of Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. The first, oops, the first Christ scripture reading is Proverbs 8, 1 through 4, and 22 through 31. Does not wisdom call, and does not understanding raise her voice? On the heights beside the way, at the crossroads she takes her stand. Beside the gates in front of the town, at the entrance of the portals, she cries out, To you, O people, I call, and my cry is to all that live. The Lord created me at the beginning of his work, the first of his acts of long ago. Ages ago I was set up, at the first before the beginning of the earth. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no springs abounding with water, before the mountains had been shaped, before the hills, I was brought forth. When he had not yet made earth and fields or the world's first bits of soil, when he established the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep, when he made firm the skies above, when he established the fountains of the deep, when he assigned to the sea its limit, so that the waters might not transgress his command, when he marked out on the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him like a master worker, and I was daily his delight. Rejoicing before him always, rejoicing in his inhabited world, and delighting in the human race. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. As we move into our um, time of prayer, I have a couple of praises and one prayer request to put before you. Uh, the prayer request is uh, we want to continue to pray for Betty. Uh, it, Betty Wickert has gone into Tuscola Nursing Home just hopefully for a short period of time while she recovers from uh, what I found out this week was a collapsed lung uh, due to pneumonia. So she's got a long road of healing ahead of her, but we are hopeful that she will end up being able to go back into her assisted living program before too terribly long. I also had a wonderful visit with Carol Weimer this week uh, and we'll keep you updated as we know more about her, but she was feeling pretty good when I went to go see her after her uh, fall last week. Uh, and then I have two wonderful praises. The first is I got a text last night from Bev Schweihart telling me that the second twin came home yesterday. Now, for those of you who've been praying on this, I believe that baby is seven or eight months old and has been in the NICU his entire life. And so uh, she sent me a beautiful picture. I cried because I'm a big baby myself and uh, just absolutely beautiful. So we praise God for the blessings and the miracles that God brings us in the form of medical knowledge and, uh, and science. And then my final praise was that I had, we had a wonderful annual conference this past week. Um, believe it or not, there was, I don't recall a single real point of controversy. It was kind of a nice, quiet, uh, enjoyable annual conference, which felt great. Uh, we voted on some new policies and procedures, which Patty Russell will fill you in on in the coming weeks. But for now, I thank you for your prayers. Um, and uh, I, I just thank you for your continued prayers for the United Methodist Church as it works to redefine itself and, and move forward into the future, deciding where they would like to put their beliefs and their views. Do you have any prayer requests or praises that you would like to share this morning? Can we just pray for our children and youth? Absolutely, we can pray for our children and youth. Um, last week, if, uh, if you weren't here, we had 10 wonderful confirmants join uh, the church uh, and another one be baptized. We have uh, the wonderful Vacation Bible School program this week. We have a Wednesday program in July for our kids. We just are so happy to have them as part of our church, and I will add that to our prayer request. Darcy. We were traveling last week, and you may have already celebrated, but 
Thursday was Fox Smith's 99th birthday. No, I didn't know that one. We talked about Catherine McCumber turning 99, but I didn't know Doc Smith turned 99. Okay, y'all, you know what that means. Everybody needs to write a card today. Get it in the mail tomorrow morning because we want Doc Smith to know how much we love him. He's still down at Oddfellows. Odd Fellows. So uh, we have the address in the office. If you need it, you can call the office or if you send it to his regular address. His daughter's still visiting? No, his no. daughters aren't there. They're not there anymore. Okay. Uh, so I'm taking Mary down to see him this afternoon. Um, and I'm not sure if the daughter's coming in during the week, but there's no one here. Okay, there. so so call the office and get the Odd Fellows address if you want him to get it directly. Uh, otherwise, mail it to their uh, apartment in, in Brookstone, and he will get it when he gets back. Yes, Jackie. I see Jackie first, and then Cheryl. Go ahead. Oh, new baby in the world. They come when they want to come, don't they? Safe delivery, absolutely. We will pray. And what's her name? Carly. Carly. And then Cheryl. Um, I talked to Joyce Ellis's son, Tom, and she was moved into Brookstone. She, yes. And the transition has gone very well. Mm -hmm. And he, he was very, very pleased with how well she was here for two weeks. Yes. So he was very pleased with how well that went. Yes. We uh, talked about that briefly last week, but yes, Joyce Ellis is over in Brookstone. Um, it, this is a much better situation for her right now, and so we are glad that she's done that, and we pray for a continued, um, uh, for her experience to be a positive one as she settles in. Any others? Then let's go to God in a time of prayer. We thank you, O oh Lord, that you give us love and peace through Christ Jesus that you offer us the key to all spiritual knowledge through your Holy Spirit. For those of us who are standing today in the midst of one of life's, life's problems, we pray for your wisdom and insight. For those today who are burdened with anxiety and fear, we pray that you offer your wise assurance in times of need. For those facing a major life decision, we ask that you bless them with your wisdom. For those entering a new chapter in their lives, be it having a new baby, taking a new job, finding a place to live, or entering retirement, guide them on the proper path and bless them with a sense of peace. We pray in particular today for those we love whom we have mentioned and those who are silently on our hearts and minds. We pray today for Carly, for Betty, for Doc Smith, for Joyce Ellis, for Baby Miles, for the United Methodist Church. And Lord, we pray a special prayer today for our children and our youth. May they feel your love um, every time they see the face of one of our church members. May they know that you are watching over them from on high every time they hear one of our concerned voices saying, wait, don't touch that, don't go there. We ask, Lord, that they may know uh, they are your children and walk closer with you. This we pray in the name and the wisdom of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
scripture reading is Psalm 85. Lord, you were favorable to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people. You pardoned all their sin. Selah. You withdrew all your wrath. You turned from your hot anger. Restore us again, O God, of our salvation, and put away your indignation toward us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you praising? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not revive us again so that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your steadfast love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people, to his faithful, to those who turn to him in their hearts. Surely his salvation is at hand for those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet righteousness, and peace will kiss each other. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground, and righteousness will look down from the sky. The Lord will give what is good, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him and will make a path for his steps. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I hope y'all are okay with all this wonderful old music we're doing in the month of June as we prepare for a revival. I figured I wouldn't get a lot of complaints, so enjoy the fun old hymns. Someone I don't know gave me a gift well, all of us, really, a gift about a month ago. Um, this person sent the church, addressed to the pastor, a packet that she found in a deceased relative's belongings. These items were particularly special to us here because they included a bulletin from January 1st, 1929, from our church, our uh, Tuscola Methodist Episcopal Church, as it was called at the time. And I'm working on getting that bulletin framed to hang in the library because it's so fascinating to see uh, what was going on at the time. And I can tell you in the concerns listed on the back, their biggest concern was why more people aren't going to church. 
nice to know we don't have that problem anymore. So we've solved that one. There were two other wonderful things in this packet. One was an amazing letter uh, written by a church member who it looks like she lived right next door to the old church across from, from South Ward uh, in a house that is not there anymore. And she was writing to a friend of hers over in Paris, Illinois, about what was going on in the church. So there's wonderful news uh, about Tuscola. She was very tired because she had just finished putting on the entire Christmas pageant done by all of the children and youth of the church. And she said she needed a vacation. So again, some things never change. Um, the final thing was one of my favorites. It was a United Methodist Boys magazine that was sent out. Uh, I, it looks like monthly, perhaps quarterly. And the date of this magazine was December 28, 1929. And there was a wonderful, wonderful article in it. There were several uh, cute articles. Some were stories. I mean, sure, many of you remember uh, the more modern version of the old boys magazines, but a lot of them were stories and poems written by boys at the time and submitted. But there were some great articles, and the one I gravitated to was called The Next Hundred Years, written on the eve of 19. Now, to put this into perspective, this article came out two months after the stock market crash that we knew we know uh, was going to cause the Great Depression, but most likely they weren't feeling it quite so much here yet. But this article, even coming out when it did, was incredibly hopeful about the future. It spent the first part of the article highlighting the leaps and bounds in medical and science technology that had come in the past year, in 1929, uh, including uh, the invention of radiation for tumors for the first time. Uh, in New York, a steel frame prefab house was put together in less than three hours. A seaplane flying directly over the water made it to a speed of, and I was impressed by this, 360 miles per hour in 1929. The first x-ray of the human brain had uh, alive had been performed. It also made some predictions in the magazine for what a smart boy should consider looking into for a career, and it was an incredibly prescient uh, article because it suggested that they all go into electricity. It said electricity was the new wave of the future, and I think they might have been right. The article predicted the future way more than I would have guessed. And even with the major negatives going on right before it was written, it didn't dwell on the negatives. Instead, it looked forward to the future with optimism. The stock market had crashed. The worst had happened. It was time to look forward. Today's passage from Psalms walks us through the Israelites' journey with God. They are looking back to the past, they are looking at God, to God at the present, and they are looking forward to a future with God. Now this is the kind of scripture that we usually pull out on New Year's Eve or New Year's Day, but as we're getting ready to walk through a revival, in two weeks' time, I felt it was important to take a look at our past, our current situation, and to look forward to the future with God. So let's begin with the past in the past. At the time this psalm was written, it was written after the Hebrews had most likely returned from exile. So for those of you who don't know enough about your history yet on this, 
the, uh, in the 700 BCs, the Israelites were carried off into captivity by the Babylonians who destroyed Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, left the town in rubble, and took almost everyone to Babylon uh, and forced them to live there. Seventy years later, they were freed and sent back home. So now you have the Israelites standing in the midst of extreme rubble. Their temple has been destroyed. Their buildings are falling apart from standing 70 years with no maintenance. And they cry out to God, remembering the past. Lord, you were favorable to your land. You did restore the fortunes of Jacob. But time and time again, the Hebrews had to acknowledge they had struggled. Life had gotten hard. We know some of the challenges they had faced. Slavery in Egypt. Forty years in the desert. Years and years of warfare with the Canaanite people. Watching their friends and relatives in the northern kingdom dragged off into slavery by the Assyrians, being taken off into slavery themselves by the Babylonians. Time and time again, they had rebelled against God's love, and things had gone badly. But in looking back to the past, they also acknowledge that everything had always gotten better again. King David brought glory to the Hebrews. Solomon built God's magnificent temple. Cyrus sent them home to their land in Jerusalem. The kingdom thrived. Every time things got difficult, they threw themselves in God's love and God's mercy, and every single time, God restored the people. I wish that snapshot we have of our church in 1929 included some of the past challenges and struggles they had faced. I know that there were lots. I don't know all of them, but just like with the Jews, there's some I know would have significantly impacted Tuscola Methodist Episcopal Church. World War I would have impacted the church. The tuberculosis crisis in the early 1900s would have impacted the church. The Spanish flu outbreak of 1918 would have impacted the church. And of course, the fallout from the Civil War would have impacted the church. And yet, as they stand there in the hope uh, of, of moving to 1930, they're not talking about those things. They're talking about the ways they've been blessed. The Christmas pageant that had just been performed by the young people of the church. They focus on the work of the United Methodist Women in Labor Law, and I need you to know United Methodist Women were some of the most influential in getting rid of child labor laws in the United States, so if you are a woman in faith now, you should be proud of that history. These are the things they were focused on in 1930. God had held them tightly through all of their moments, both the good and the bad. Over and over, God had walked with Tuscola Methodist Episcopal Church. God showed how faithful God will be. The community of Tuscola had been blessed time and time again just like the Hebrews, no matter how bad things got, they had proof that God loved them and would be with them. But sometimes in moments 
in the present, we forget that. When bad things happen in our community, we cry out to God, where were you? Instead of acknowledging that God was right there, grieving with us. The day of September 11, 2001, I still remember, not, not the early part of the day, that's almost a blur to me, but one of the things that is etched very strongly in my memory was at the end of the day, driving back home, I had to cross a, a major bridge over the intercoastal waterway, and it was a gray, icky day, unlike the beautiful day that they had had in New York that we all remember now in, in our memories. It was a gray and cloudy day in Florida, and as I came to the top of the bridge, numb and angry and in pain and crying out to God, where were you? Why didn't you stop this? Why didn't you help? I saw something that I know for a fact was given to me by God. I saw a rainbow in the sky. The most perfect, full arch, bright colored rainbow that I'd ever seen out over the ocean. And to me, what it said was God was saying to me, I am here with you. I am crying too. I am grieving beside you. I love you. It happened to the Jews too. The second part of Psalms takes place as they look around their present circumstances and mourn more than more and cry out in anger, grief, and pain to God. Where were you when our temple was destroyed? They feel forgotten. And so they beg God to restore them. Verses 4 through 7 speak of their present reality and the reality in which all of us find ourselves in, in present catastrophes. They say, they say, restore us again, O God, of our salvation, and put away your indignation toward us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? And here's the big question. Will you not revive us again so that we may rejoice in you? Early theology, Old Testament theology, is a little different than what we believe today. They believed if things were going badly, it was because God was punishing them. Because they hadn't kept their faithful part of the covenant. We don't believe that today, but let me tell you what we do believe. We do believe that when things are going badly, when things are falling apart, that it is so much better to cling to God than anything a human being can offer you. And so, while we don't turn to God because we feel that we have to in order to negate a punishment, we turn to God in trust and perfect love. Verse 6 calls directly for that revival. What does the psalmist mean by revival here? The psalmist is asking God to bring them back into God's presence, into God's grace, into God's glory, to restore their spirits. I look back at Tuscola Methodist Episcopal Church at the dawn of the 30s. The worst had happened, but they didn't know it yet. The initial part of the stock market only affected the very, very wealthy and those who had businesses. But over the next few years, three years, 50% of U.S. banks would fail. Over the next three years, the unemployment rate would rise to 30% in the United States. Our little church in our little community had no idea what they were facing. And they had no idea what they were going to face over the next 92 years. They couldn't even have imagined the things that would
would shake their faith and stun their community over and over again. The Great Depression, the Dust Bowl, Pearl Harbor, World War II, Japanese internment, the Holocaust, the Cuban Missile Crisis, the Korean War, the assassinations of JFK, of Bobby Kennedy, of Martin Luther King Jr., the Vietnam War, the march in Selma, the beginning of the crazy materialism of the 1980s, the war on drugs, the war on crime, September 11th, COVID, and the slow decline of churches across Europe and the United States. That's what the future held for our little church in 1929. We can sit here with a clear view and look back at the trauma that would over and over again envelop Tuscola, but because we have a clear view looking back, we also can see some different things because we know there were also amazing joys waiting for our congregation. In 1930, the infant mortality rate was 25%. One in four babies didn't make it to their first birthday. Today, that number is 5%. And we know we can go lower. Advances in medical care have changed the reality from one in 10 people dying of tuberculosis in 1930 to tuberculosis being an almost completely eradicated disease that can be easily treated and, and, uh, and tested for. In fact, antibiotics and other medical advancements have completely changed the world. In 1930, the average life expectancy for a man was 58 years old, and women, you had until 62. Now, our life expectancy is 79, and many people are blowing past that and living active, vital lives into their 90s. In 1940s, chemotherapy was invented, which meant that cancer was no longer a death sentence. The 1950s brought an economic security like the world had never known, where people began to spend an average of 30% of their income on non-essential items for the first time in history. And we know that an economic security has only grown then you get to the space race and the moon landing in the 60s, along with the first heart transplants, civil rights, women's rights, and of course, the computer and communication boom of the 1990s and beyond. I wonder what your great-grandparents would think of the fact that you can right now call someone in Singapore, see their face in real time, talk to them with a crystal clear communication, and not be charged a cent for it. It would have been unthinkable to them. From our viewpoint in 2022, we can see the hand of God on Tuscola Methodist Episcopal Church. We can see how God was walking with them, leading them to where we are today, which brings us to the final section of the psalm the future. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. You see, the Jews knew. They knew because they looked back at their history that God was going to continue to be with them in the worst moments. And that eventually those moments would turn good. God brings us amazing blessings even while we're in the midst of suffering. Therefore, there is every expectation to believe that God will continue to walk with us as we move forward. God will speak peace over Tuscola. God will continue to bless us. Steadfast love and faithfulness.
Jesus will meet and righteousness and peace will kiss each other. The world will be God's kingdom. Just like Tuscola Methodist Episcopal Church in 1929, we stand here with no clear idea of what the future will look like. But here is what we do know. The future, just like the past, will bring some heartaches. It will bring pain. It will bring unrest and war and terrorism and new diseases and economic issues. We know that because it is part of life on earth. But we also know that during those darkest times, God will be right beside Tuscola United Methodist Church. And we know that God will bless us over and over again. And we don't know what form those blessings will take, but we can be sure they will exist. God has walked with our congregation for 150 years. God isn't going anywhere. God doesn't need a revival. God doesn't need a revival to love us more, to walk with us more faithfully. Perhaps a revival is for us. We need a revival so that we can see the blessings that God has put in front of us. We need the revival to restore our sense of trust and hope in God. We need a revival to renew our sense of commitment to the church. We need a revival to feel the joy of God. We need a revival to remember that God is good. God's not going anywhere. It's time for us to make the move in the right direction toward God.
through grace and peace, may we have the wisdom to be transformed. For suffering leads to endurance. Endurance gives rise to character, and character produces hope. In true hope, hope founded by God, we are never disappointed. Go in peace. Amen.